Please stand for the ministry of the word. The Old Testament reading from this morning comes from the book of Proverbs. Does not wisdom call? Does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights beside the way, at the crossroads, she takes her stand. Beside the gates in front of the town, and at the entrance of the portal, she cries aloud. To you, O men, I call, and my cry is to the children of man. O simple ones, learn prudence. O fools, learn sense. Hear, for I will speak noble things, and from my lips will come what is right, for my mouth will utter truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are righteous. There is nothing twisted or crooked in them. They are all straight to him who understands, and right to those who find knowledge. Take my instruction instead of silver, and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than jewels, and all that you may desire cannot compare with her. The epistle lesson comes from the book of Colossians. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope that is laid up for you in heaven. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased praying for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, and giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. And the Gospel from Matthew. When Jesus finished instructing his twelve disciples, he went from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John heard from prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears, let him hear. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. By Jesus uh, on the life of John the Baptizer after John expressed his concerns that maybe Jesus wasn't looking out to be who he thought he was. Yeah. Uh, but uh, wonderful. 
violent they were away. <coughs> well, I have struggled mightily with this week's sermon. I struggled so badly that I uh, outlined for Sandra last night and she seemed totally the best. She didn't throw me out of the room or anything. But, uh, you know what this is? This is uh, an ad that appears uh, on the bulletin board out front. And I'm going to have bullet inserts. Uh, this year, uh, the uh, Ligonier Conference folk have been very aggressive in marketing their, their Ligonier Conference in Orlando, which I, we've been to several times. It's a wonderful conference. Uh, and uh, it's going to be, uh, what is it, um, February 21st to 23rd here in Orlando, in Orlando Baptist, the first Baptist Church of Orlando. Uh, World-class Reformed scholars are there. Just three days of intense, awesome teaching. And some wonderful hymn singing. When, uh, you've never, I, I had never, until uh, my last time down here, been seated in a huge church that seats 6,100 6, at a pop, where everybody's Here's the Italian singer, and you're singing to a world-class organist and a world-class pianist and a brass choir. I mean, yikes, it's awesome. And the teaching is just uh, icing on top of the cake. Uh, I, I got in the back of my mind why I can do a church trip down there. We'll be talking about 10 people down there, about 8 or 10 years ago. We might have had a whole bunch of them. It was great. Uh, this year's theme is No Compromise, Standing for the Truth of God's Word. Uh, let's see, John Piper. Cynthia Ferguson, Robert Godfrey, um, Stephen Lawson, Arthur Bull's horse, Cal Thomas, what? Cal Thomas, and Rabbi Zacharias. So, um, that's quite a list. Pardon? Uh, how many beds are there this year? Oh, no, what's wrong with this bed? Oh, this is John Parker, this is bed. Yeah, Alice Begg will be there. These are all wonderful teachers, and they, they're given a theme. And they teach around the thing every year. It's just pretty awful. So more, more on that later. Keep those dates in mind. The last, uh, last week in February. Like I said, I've been struggling, <clears throat> but I decided to preach anyway. Here's a, uh, here's a proverb. Wisdom will multiply your days <clears throat> and add years to your life. <clears throat> If you become wise, you will be the one to benefit. If you scorn wisdom, you will be the one to suffer. When you open the book of Proverbs, written mostly by King Solomon, who the Bible says during his lifetime was the wisest man on earth. You might find a lot of Proverbs like the one I just read. Short, clear, it contains... Uh, a nice mixture of sage observation and some hopeful conjecture. I mean, really, will wisdom multiply your days and add years to your life? Uh, you know, that's debatable. Uh, it'll make your life better. It might make you last longer, but that's all in God's hands anyway. But there's usually just some common sense. Uh, sometimes uh, they're very obvious. But that is not all the Proverbs. Uh, some of the couplet Proverbs, the ones that we know by heart, most of them, uh, they, they can be like bumper stickers or, or uh, magnets on your refrigerator door. Here's a couple of those. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. Oh. Doesn't that sound bumper stickery? Uh, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Uh, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. These are all good. There are lots of those. Uh, perhaps the most, uh, the best known proverb is its least typical. Uh, Proverbs 31, the one we hear read every Mother's Day. And women say, why isn't there a husband proverb like that one? It puts husbands on the spot. But uh, that's a long exhortation, uh, an ode to uh, a godly wife and mother. Some proverbs are truly thought-provoking, inspiring, and instructive. Stuff with classic memory verses. I've memorized some of these. By wisdom a house is built, through understanding it is established, and through knowledge its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. I use that by marriage counseling all the time. By wisdom a house is built, and through knowledge it is established. Uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, many of us know this by heart. Trust the Lord with all your heart, and <coughs> lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and... He will direct your paths. Sure. 
Uh, here is uh, that when the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Proverbs is interesting. Uh, I've never tried to preach to it because I'm not sure you can. It's, it has no shape or pattern. And uh, you, you visit commentaries looking into Proverbs, and they drive you crazy too because you can tell they don't know how to approach it either. It is essentially a collection of pithy sayings. Uh, mostly, uh, some come in the form of, of advice from a father to a son. We get the picture of, of Solomon, perhaps, uh, talking to his son Jeroboam, Jeroboam uh, about uh, you know, how you should live your life. As a child of God, how you should conduct your life. Uh, but uh, there are other writers of Proverbs are included in this book. And we believe all these to be inspired by the Holy Spirit. But still, all of it is just, just little couplets of advice. Uh, we all have our favorites. Uh, pride goes before destruction, and a humble spirit before a fall. Here's one of my favorites. This is the NLT version of it. We may throw the dice, but the Lord determines how they fall. <laughs> and of course, uh, my own favorite. A foolish son is his father's ruin, and a quarrelsome wife is like a constant dripping. Don't you find that inspiring? <laughs> that is not a personal revelation, by the way. But you know, when you teach uh, on wisdom, and this short series is kind of evolved into a series, you have to come eventually to the book of Proverbs. Uh, along with Job and Ecclesiastes, Proverbs forms up what the Bible and scholars call uh, the section in the Bible called Wisdom Literature. And uh, it, is, it is, again and again and again, talking about wisdom, like the lecture read it, that uh, Carol read, the selection from Proverbs. Uh, so many sections of Proverbs, which, which depicts wisdom as a female, Sophia, wisdom. Uh, wisdom is, is calling to the world to, to wise up, calling to the church to wise up. Uh, lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge God. Wise up, O church of God. Now it also depicts the wisdom of the world uh, as a character they call, he calls the harlot. Uh, the harlot will tell you what you want to hear in order to extract from you what she wants. Don't be fooled. But we have these images contrasted back and forth again and again. And so I've been reading through Proverbs a couple times during the sermon series. And I stumbled upon one the other day. I think I read it for the second or third time, and it struck me. Uh, listen to this. It, it contains a, an interesting uh, phrase. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. Here. I read that, and I said, you know, I, I recognize that. That's seven pillars. And how many of you have actually vaguely remembered this phrase, the seven pillars of wisdom? That's all? I am that unusual? Wow, I thought I was like in the mainstream. Hmm. Yeah, uh, the seven pillars of wisdom. In my studies, uh, I came upon a photograph of this extraordinary rock formation which rises up out of, above the desert floor in what is now Jordan. And that rock formation, which is really a mountain standing by itself, uh, has been over the centuries, by the sands of time, uh, shaped, contoured into what looks like a collection of pillars. And that rock formation has been called for eons the seven pillars of wisdom in reflection to this verse in Proverbs. And then I remembered and verified that one of my favorite old movies, 1962 Lawrence of Arabia, how many have seen that movie? Good. Yeah, it's, it's not, it is now 50 years old. By the way. Now, uh, Lawrence of Arabia, uh, made the life of T.E. Lawrence, at least the Middle Eastern exploits of T.E. Lawrence, who was a British military archaeologist who decided to take part in the Arab revolt against Turkey. And it's beautifully portrayed in the movie uh, by Peter O'Toole, but it is based on Lawrence's biography, which he called The Seven Pillars of Wisdom. Well, that made me look okay, well, this would be a great sermon stuff. You know, I'll, I'll just look up, uh, I'll find the seven pillars of wisdom, and we'll do a sermon on each one. That'll take us right into Advent. Cool. Well, there's nowhere in the scriptures. Nowhere 
are the seven pillars which wisdom has hewn for her house. Nowhere are they enumerated. Well, so that's a mystery. The Bible does lots of those, but this was really a preacher's mystery. Okay, what do I do with this? Well, I thought, I thought, I thought. Um, what's a pillar? What is a pillar? We don't, I'm, I have a, a background in construction. I began working HVAC in 1964. And uh, you don't, we don't use that word much, pillar much anymore. What's a pillar? Pillar of somebody sleep on. Pillar of sleep on, yeah. <laughs> Only if you're from West Virginia. <laughs> What's a pillar? It's a supporting column. It's a supporting column. Now, in the time this was written, if you wanted to have a great room with lots of open space, you had to use pillars. We didn't have beams or trusses or TJIs. You had to use pillars to hold up the roof. And we all, right now, I know you're thinking of Samson. How close did you have to bring those pillars to Samson when they were knocked over? You know, when, when he brought the temple down on the heads of his tormentors. Uh, pillars held up the roof. And so since this is a construction analogy, I began to think, and this happened, you know, rather spontaneously, of other scripture passages uh, which allude to building construction. Essentially, they are foundations, walls, and partitions. And I'll go back to uh, one of the Proverbs I read. Uh, by wisdom, a house is built, and through understanding, it is established. Now, before I go into some of the things you're already thinking about, let's pray. Lord, be with us as we study your word. Guide us, Lord, from this time of, of thoughtful meditation into the visible word, the table of the Lord, communion, Lord, uh, in a way that edifies the church, O oh Lord, and glorifies you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so... Um, I decided to think about the most important construction project in history. What is it? It's your life. Your life is a construction project. Your life in Christ is a construction project. The church also is a construction project, and they are welded together. The church is made up of living stones of which we are vital, lively components. So how you build your life affects how the church is constructed, and the Bible gives us specific instructions regarding how we should do that. Now the psalmist first said, the stone that the builders rejected has become the what? The chief cornerstone. That, that imagery comes from. Jesus himself used that phrase to describe himself through the Pharisees. And once again, he made them furious. You, you mean to say you're the chief cornerstone? Yeah, so many words Jesus said to you that. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And that led me to more thinking about foundations. Let us turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And uh, I hope you brought your I'm not going to finish the sermon today. I've already decided. And one of the reasons I was so vexed, I thought I could fit in one sermon, I cannot. So uh, next week, Lord willing, uh, folks, um, if I'm not too saddle sore, we'll be uh, having <laughs> Pillars of Wisdom Part 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, you've heard this, uh, this passage. You've heard me preach on it. Uh, this is Paul writing to a troubled church, one that he helped to plan himself. He spent some good time there. And uh, he's gotten word that the church is in an uproar. It's ready to split. Gee, doesn't that sound familiar? I'm Grace Brethren. It sounds like the word of the day. Somebody said something that somebody else didn't like. Somebody else made a point that crossed somebody else. And a little rift begins. And Paul's trying to dip in the blood. The issue here is personality. People were saying, you know, I miss the day that Paul was here. Man, he was my favorite preacher. This new guy is a moron. And somebody else said, Apollos, he runs rings around Paul. He's so educated. He's so brilliant. He's a much better preacher. 
she doesn't have that eye thing going on. I just mean that. And others said, you know, Paul, Apollos, they're all posers. Peter. You ever heard Peter preach? Peter's the man. And this, the church is putting on this. And so here's Paul in uh, responding, verse 5, chapter 3. Who then is Paul? And it was Apollos. But ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one. I planted. Apollos watered, but God gave the increase, so that neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. There's that building thing. Verse 9, for we are God, to be in the promise, we are God's fellow workers. You are God's, do listen, Paul says, you are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. So go over to Ephesians chapter 2. We're coming back to 1 Corinthians 3 in just a second. Ephesians chapter 2. Paul, slightly modifying his description of the foundation on which the church is to be built, the foundation on which your Christian life is being built, I trust. He says in chapter 2, verse 19, uh, I'll go back to verse 14 because he's talking to the Ephesians uh, about um, the important role Christ is playing in their lives. For he himself, verse, or pardon me, verse uh, 11, verse 14, for Christ himself is our peace, who has made both one, both Jew and Gentile in Paul's context, and has broken down the middle wall of separation. There's another construction image, one of, of, of uh, demolition. There was a wall that separated Jew and Gentile, and Paul uh, imagines that wall as being manifested by the wall of separation, actually a huge, massive, heavy curtain that separated the greater court of the temple from the Holy of Holies. And you know, in Matthew's account of our Lord's crucifixion, at the moment of Christ's death, Matthew reveals, reports that that wall, that temple, that veil was rent in two. Humongous symbolism. The Holy of Holies, by, Holy of Holies, by the work of Christ on the cross, has been flung open. Come on in! You may now approach the throne of God's grace yourself. You no longer need a mediator. Christ has broken down that wall, not only between Jew and Gentile, but between the repentant sinner and his creator. He has done this, Paul writes, verse 16, that he might reconcile them both to God, Jew and Gentile again, in one body through the cross. Therefore, putting, uh, thereby putting to death the enmity. He came and preached peace to you who are far off and to those who are near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Verse 19 now. Therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints. You are now members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together for a dwelling place for God in the Spirit. Well, that's a little passage. Yeah. That is fascinating. Paul in two different texts refers to Jesus' part as the integral Jesus Christ as the integral part of the foundation on which the church is to be constructed on which you are to build your Christian lives. No other foundation exists for that structure, Paul writes. It is built on the foundation established by the apostles and the prophets. Read the word of God. And Jesus Christ in that, the chief cornerstone. We don't talk about cornerstones either much. Uh, and my students build a school every, uh, a house every year or two. 
and we always have a cornerstone ceremony. It's not a real cornerstone. It's a, it's a fake cornerstone with the name on it when this house was built. It's kind of nice. It's kind of cute. But a chief cornerstone in this culture was the only part of the building which was meticulously and carefully engineered to be perfectly square. They were four of them. And they built up the foundation of every major structure. And great pains were taken to the, you know, the, we use the term in the trade, Eric knows this, Eric's selling baskets today, but he knows this term, shooting the lines, making sure that all four corners, all four cornerstones are perfectly set. And it was one cornerstone that was set first. All the lines arrived from that, all the squares. And Paul says, that's Jesus Christ. And the rest of the foundation is constructed in alignment with that cornerstone. And that makes the foundation perfectly stable in an unstable world. Perfectly strong and sufficient in a world that often leaves us wanting. Perfectly strong to withstand the storms that life will bring. You build on that foundation. As a master builder, Paul said, I was called to lay it. Apollos has been called to start building on it. And now you are to continue that process. But then Paul said in 1 Corinthians, be careful what you build with. Let's turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He said, we are God's fellow workers. We are God's, you are God's build, you are God's building. Let each one, verse 10, take heed how he builds on that foundation. Verse 11, for no other foundation can anyone lay that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, verse 12, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. Paul says everybody will attempt to build their Christian life on this, every devoted disciple of Christ will attempt to build his or her life on this foundation and we will use some world class, first class, high quality products and we will also use some stuff that won't stand the test of time, that won't be able to withstand the fires that come into your life, the firestorms that blow through your life. Yesterday, when I talked to Joanne, it was obvious to me that I was not surprised that uh, her life with Mark was built on a firm foundation and it was built with an awful lot of gold and precious stones because she was strong. Oh, she was grieving. She was broken hearted. But she had no doubts about this work. It's rather awe inspiring. It's breathtaking. To, to hear someone say that at that moment in their lives. We say it all the time in church. It really sounds impressive, but when it happens to you, when you're up against it, when your world has been shattered, out of the blue, it seems, and you can still say, praise the Lord. you got something going. You're building something that's going to stand the test of time the rest of your life. It's going to stand the test of raising children, dealing with adult children, it's going to raise the test of getting older and more feeble and losing your memory and having people, needing people to take care of you as you enter old age. It's going to, it's going to be able to stand all of that. It's going to make every day you live have value and substance. Make every day of your life matter. If you build on that foundation with precious stones, gold and silver. If you build with wood, and straw and hay, Paul indicates that God will test that structure. It'll be tested. And you'll see after the firestorm blows through, there are great gaping holes in your wall. Well, that didn't hold up. Fill those gaps with gold and silver. And this is also how you build a church of Jesus Christ. And we're building, essentially, two structures, a structure within a structure. We're building a church, a temple, which is the place of God's presence. The church, not this church building particularly, but the church of Jesus Christ on Reformation Sunday, all the saints, all the saints form the church of Jesus Christ. They are all as one, the place where God's glory dwells, the place of God's presence. 
And guess what? Paul also says, and your lives are temples. What? Know you not that you are a temple? The Holy Spirit? You're not your own? You're bought with a price. Don't you know that? See to your building project, church. See to your building project. Oh, well, there's a division of labor. I was going to get into this, but not time today. We'll come back to this some next week, but that's going to lay us down quickly. God lays the foundation. He also, I believe, provides a shelter, a covering. Uh, I'll call it His grace. And we're called upon as the Christian, as the Christian nation, to erect the superstructure between that foundation which God has carefully laid. Underneath the protected covering of God's grace, we're called upon to build our lives. The superstructure of our Christian lives. Now, how's your building project coming? Are you building your your temple on the sure foundation? What did Jesus say in Matthew seven? People who listen to my words that are very they're like me, a man who built his house on the rock. People who hear the preacher. Listen to the guy on the radio, preach from the Word, sing the songs, read the scriptures, and don't obey them. That's like a person who builds his house on a foundation of sin, which of course is nonsense. And then Jesus said, in both persons' lives, the wise man who built his house on the foundation of rock and the foolish man who built his house on the foundation of sand, the storms of life will blow, the rains will come down on both houses. Building your house on the right foundation doesn't mean you've got a life with no trouble. But it means when the trouble comes, and beloved, it will come. It is coming. It has come. And it will keep on coming. Your house will stand strong. Remember the old song? We'll do this right now. We should do it again. Wise man built his house upon the rock. Wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. And the rains came down the land again. That's enough. It's wise to let you know it. The rains came down. Floods came up. And the foolish man. And so this is. So that's the first question. What are you building your Christian life on? Is it? A, I, I know a lot of people who are not only Christians who go to church every Sunday. Who, when I hear their preachers preach, when I hear them talk in conversation, they're building their house on a foundation. Listen, which is not Jesus Christ. He's become kind of one of their building materials. They're building their house on a foundation of logic, of emotion, of sentimentality, or of scientific evidence. And they're building their house according to the terms, the specifications of the wisdom of the world. And history shows those houses don't stand. Those houses get blown away, blown apart. So the first question to yourself is, where are you building your Christian house? Second is, what materials are you using? I, I know some of the stuff we build with makes complete total sense, you know, financial security, good health, good job, uh, enough, and on and on it goes. Uh, uh, plants, careful plants, once again, i got to think of Mark and Joanne who had laid out a wonderful last chapter of their lives. And laid it out, I'm sure, with this caveat, uh, Deo Valente. But that changed. That was taken away by God's providence. Are you building your house of faith, your Christian life, on stuff that won't hold up? Your 401k? Your retirement plan. I'm not saying these things aren't important, beloved, but I'm saying they are not gold or silver. Maybe you're, I mean, my wife watches Fox News all the time, and William Devane comes in about every five minutes talking about uh, his gold. You know, how he's worked hard his whole life, and he wants to keep his money, no one's going to take it, and so he buys gold, and he keeps on buying gold. And, you know, uh, William Devane, bless his heart, seems to think that gold will make him live forever. Well, you know, he's, I'm sure he's a wise guy and, and, a, and, a, and a good investor, a, a, a perspicacious investor. I know you all love that word. I know you do. But if that's what he thinks will stand the test of time, he's wrong. Bless his heart. 
It's better than paper, I'm sure. But see, that's it. You got you got to examine your faith, church. Now, we're going to conclude this the the series on wisdom next week, Lord willing. And I'm going to visit the seven pillars. I promise. Uh, like I said, lots of preachers have brought them up. Uh, I've seen all kinds of lists. Some, of, some make sense. Some are kind of routine. James 3, where we began this series, is a great place to find seven pillars of wisdom. Maybe not the seven pillars of wisdom, but seven pillars of wisdom. We'll talk about that next week. We're going to talk about building materials for your house and for God's house that you might not have considered. So come back next week, Lord willing, for part two of Seven Pillars of Wisdom. Let us pray. Father, we wrestle with knowing, oftentimes, how to live our Christian lives. We know, Lord, that it needs to be more than the sum total of the hours we spend in church or the time we spend in Scripture. These are components, Lord. But by and large, Father, uh, we seem to live our lives and build our Christian lives from crisis to crisis. And Father, I'm quite sure that is not what you have in mind. We need to see, Father, our lives as an ongoing journey, an ongoing project, a sacred journey, which takes us from the moment we made the decision for Jesus Christ until the time that our salvation is made complete. And Father, I'm sure that this is a path to blessing that carries from day to day, not just from crisis to crisis. So Lord, I pray that you will continue to work in our hearts and our minds to make us wise. Give us a heart of wisdom, we pray, as we consider the rest of our lives in this most important building project. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.